The book of Acts chapter 6, we have a, a lengthy story in the book of Acts that we're going to take in one message this morning. But it's all one story, and so it, it fits into a, a single message, but it is all the way from the end of chapter 6 to the beginning of chapter 8. On October 16th, 1555, two men, bishops of the church named Ridley and Latimer, were led to a stake of wood in Oxford, England, and burned to death. They were killed because neither Ridley nor Latimer could accept the Catholic Mass as a sacrifice of Christ. Latimer told the commissioners, Christ made one sacrifice for the sins of the whole world, and that a perfect sacrifice. Neither needeth there to be, nor can there be, any other propitiatory sacrifice. These opinions were deeply offensive to Roman Catholic theologians. Both Ridley and Latimer were burned at the stake in Oxford, and as he was being tied, Ridley prayed, O oh, Heavenly Father, I give unto thee most hearty thanks that thou hast called me to be a professor of thee, even unto death. I beseech thee, Lord God, have mercy on this realm of England and deliver it from all her enemies. Latimer died much more quickly. As the flames quickly rose, Latimer encouraged Ridley, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley. And play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. That candle indeed burned on and here we are this morning preaching the grace of God and the once and for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Latimer and Ridley were not the last, and they were not the first that were so taken with the glory of Jesus Christ as God's one and only Messiah. But they did reveal something in their death, that Jesus and the truth about him is worth any offering, even life itself. And the foundational demonstration of that reality, that the truth about Jesus is worth any offering, even life itself, was revealed in this chapter that we're going to read this morning. This chapter is the foundational revelation that the truth about Jesus as the risen Messiah is worth any offering from those who believe in him, even life itself. It is a, it is a cherished chapter precisely because it is the first, the first of a long line of glorious and honorable offerings given to the Lord Jesus throughout the ages. But this is the first. This is the foundation that would lead ultimately to Latimer and Ridley and Tyndale and thousands of others. This is the beginning. We're going to read through this story in, in five sections because of its length, and I'll give a caption to each section that I think will, will indicate something of how the story progresses. The first one we might call supernatural witness. Just a couple of verses, but it sets the stage for the story. Supernatural witness. Let's begin reading in chapter 6 of verse 8. It says this, And Stephen, well, remember Stephen, he was one of the men appointed for practical ministry to serve the widows at the beginning of chapter 6, but apparently he did more than only serving uh, practically because it says he was full of grace and power and was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. 
So the framework of this lengthy story is going to be that Stephen, this practical leader in the church, is apparently given this overwhelming power from God to do signs among the people. We don't know if those are miracles. I mean, some kind of supernatural evidence is attending his ministry. And then certain Jewish people that belong to the freedmen and others from around the world, Cyrenians and Alexandrians, uh, they begin to dispute with Stephen. Likely they're disputing what he's saying about Jesus and the culmination of God's purposes in Jesus. They are angry about that. They begin to argue with him. But apparently, the Holy Spirit has so filled Stephen, and it was noted earlier that he is a man of wisdom, that as he's speaking, their arguments are useless. They're not able, it says, to withstand him. You can imagine him standing in front of these crowds and people, bystanders watching, and he's proclaiming about Jesus and declaring in him the Messiah come from God. And, and these people, these Jews, are trying to dispute. How, how can a man like Jesus be God's Messiah? It can't be true what you're saying about God's purposes. But his arguments, and as we'll see later, his biblical arguments, are so profound, so wise, so full of the Spirit, that they don't have any ability rhetorically to resist him. Somehow it was, it was demonstrated that this is the one with the wisdom and these that are arguing with him uh, do not have that wisdom. So there's this supernatural power that's attending both Stephen in his miracles that he's performing and also in his witness that God is using him in this powerful way in dispute and rhetoric and also as he's proclaiming, uh, as he's doing these miracles along the way. So supernatural witness is the, the, the foundation. And we want to pay attention. In narrative, it's important to pay attention to the facts of what's happening. What, what facts are taking place? Stephen is undeniably attended by supernatural power. Fact number one. And yet, people are resisting him. This kind of lays the groundwork for what's to come. It begins to point into the future. What's God doing in this? Undeniable supernatural power. Miracles and signs and a kind of witness that cannot be resisted. And yet, people are resisting him. Supernatural witness. First snapshot. Second snapshot. Slanderous attack. Slanderous attack. Verse 11. Then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. Should be familiar by now in Acts. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will come and destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. So these, these people use some of what he's saying, and yet they seem to exaggerate it and even to turn it into a falsehood against him. They're called false witnesses. Now, again, we want to feel the use of irony in the book of Acts, as in many narratives in the scriptures. Irony is just something that God loves, apparently. So he uses it a lot. It is ironic that false witnesses, which are explicitly forbidden by the law, are rising up to condemn Stephen as being against the law. All right? So there's slanderous witnesses explicitly prohibited by the law of God, and they're claiming that he is blaspheming Moses, which is not a reference to Moses' person. It's more reference to the writings of Moses, probably, the traditions that Moses handed down in the law, and God himself. Now, now this is a serious charge. Ultimately, this would be a charge warranting a death warrant, he is blaspheming Moses and God and even the temple itself. It says Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy this place. Now, you, you could not get a, a more important triad than God, Moses, and the temple to a Jew. So to say that Stephen is blaspheming God and Moses and that he claims Jesus of Nazareth is going to destroy this temple and change the customs that Moses delivered to us, uh, there could not be a more devastating slanderous charge. And as with most slanderous charges, there probably is a kernel of truth in what they're saying. And the church needs to be prepared for this as well. It, it's, it's unusual that the enemy who is wily 
and smart, uses just outright lies in his accusations of the witnesses of the gospel. Normally, there is a kernel of truth. And there was probably a kernel of truth. Stephen was probably saying something about how the coming of Jesus radically transforms how people can read the law. Uh, for, for one reason, we, we shouldn't be sacrificing lambs anymore. I mean, that's a one just as an example. There probably was some changes he was recommending in how we interpret the law. There probably was some changes in what he's saying and how we interpret the temple, since Jesus is the new temple. There probably was some kernel of truth, and he's saying, look, the coming of Jesus is the culmination of all these things that Moses and God were pointing forward to. You've too narrowly confined God, he's going to say in a few minutes. God is able to have his own culmination of his own plan. He's not limited to the traditions you would prefer to stay forever. So there's a kernel of truth, but it's not true that he is blaspheming God. Quite the contrary, he's representing God. So the irony continues, and it continues in verse 15. Again, the readers are treated to this sort of enticing irony throughout the story. Gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw, all saw, that his face was like the face of an angel. Now, angels were very important to Jewish people. Very important because the angels were, were, were those that were God's spokesmen, God's messengers. They were God's, God's deliverers of his purposes. And so you have this contrast again. You're blaspheming God, but somehow you look like an angel of God. There's this frustrating irony, and you're supposed to feel that as you're reading this story. This, it just keeps... Being disappointing, we keep telling everybody that these people are against God, and man, God keeps using them to perform miracles and to look like angels. It is just the most frustrating conundrum if you're a Jewish leader. And so this is what's happening in the story. You see this building tension. Now he looks like an angel. He's not just doing miracles. He looks like an angel from heaven as he sits in the council facing these slanderous accusations. All right, slanderous attack, verse 11 through 15. Let's keep going. Section three, biblical rebuke. Now, this is the longest section. We'll read it in one chunk, and then I'll kind of walk through and explain some of the major themes. Basically, they, they bring Stephen in, and the high priest says, are these things so? That you are blaspheming God, the temple, the law. Are these things so? And then Stephen launches into a speech. It is an incredibly wise subtle and insightful speech that leads finally to an overwhelmingly <laughs> crushing rebuke for the council. Now, since we are not first century Jews, we may not pick up on, and maybe if, when you read this, you'll feel like, wow, that was an abrupt ending, Stephen. That was very abrupt. You go from kind of this historical references to Moses and Joseph and everybody, and all of a sudden you're like, you people never, it just feels like you lose your temper at the end. Not the case. Let me walk through and explain why that's true. Let's read it first. Brothers and fathers, Stephen says, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land of the Chaldeans and live in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Yet he gave him no inheritance in it, not even a foot's length, but promised to give it to him as a possession and to his offspring after him, though he had no child. And God spoke to this effect, that his offspring would be sojourners in a land belonging to others who would enslave them and afflict them 400 years. But I will judge the nation that they serve, said God, and after that they shall come out and worship me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs. All right, first point about this section of the story. Stephen is very subtly doing a couple of things. First of all, he is rejecting the idea that he is anti-God's working in Israel. So he's establishing his affirmation that he is a faithful believer that God called Abraham, their great forefather. But he is also making the point, subtly or not so subtly, God is not limited to this land he works in this land. He brought us to this land. But if you remember, brothers, then again, you notice the subtle power of his speech. God met Abraham before he was in this land. He met Abraham before he was even in Haran. 
That's where he called Abraham. And if you remember also, brothers, that the promise to Abraham included the fact that they would be led out of this land and that God would meet them in deliverance in a foreign land where they were afflicted in slavery. So already at the very beginning, you have both an affirmation of Israel's history and a subtle reminder... Don't think that God is limited to this land. Yes, he brought us to this land. He brought us to this temple. Yes, but let's remember, our forefather in the faith met God outside of the limits of this land. That'll come up later. Quick reminder at the beginning of my speech. But I'm with you as a child of Abraham, our patriarchs, our forefathers, our great father Abraham. You and I both, this is our history we're talking about. That's the foundation here. I'm not some radical anti-Abraham zealot. Quite the contrary. I come from the same heritage you come from. I think you've missed part of the story. That's where he's going to go. First part. Let's keep reading. The patriarchs, that's the brothers of Joseph, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt. But God was with him and rescued him out of all his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. Now, there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our fathers on their first visit. And on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons in all. And Jacob went down into Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham had brought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamor in Shechem. Okay, again, brilliant, subtle, crushing rhetoric going on here. We're not for century Jews. We might miss it. Okay, here's the point. If you remember, brothers, remember, they're challenging him that he hates the law, right? You're against the law. Let's read the law, Stephen says. Let's read the law. If you remember, Joseph, remember Joseph? He was rejected by the brothers. These patriarchs, they rejected Joseph. And Joseph turned out to be their very deliverer. So let's read our law and remember what it says. The very one who would ultimately deliver Israel was rejected by Israel. Remember that story? The very one who was going to be ultimately God's leader, God's ruler, God's chosen one to lead Israel out of this desperate situation, he was originally rejected by the patriarchs. And if you also remember, you can feel, I mean, it's, I don't know if it's sarcastic, but it has some powerful sarcasm going on. If you remember, brothers, if you remember that here Joseph was and Jacob, and they're here in this land and this place that you revere, and you're saying I'm speaking against. If you remember, God led them out of this place, put them there in Egypt where they all died in Egypt, which was where God provided for them. What's he saying? Your attachment to this place has begun to eclipse your view of God himself. The point of this place was to point you to God, not to replace God with this place. Let's read your own law and remember some things. And also, it would be worth noting that Shechem, where all of our fathers are buried, are right now, is right now under Samaritan control. So they're all buried, and we don't even control where they're buried. What's he doing? He's just pointing out subtly but powerfully You have limited God and you have equated him with being powerful only in a certain place, a certain time, a certain dispensation. Subtly, powerfully. We wouldn't pick up on it. We feel like it's just a history lesson. They know all this stuff, Stephen. Why are you saying this? This seems like an odd speech. Oh, it's, it's powerfully chosen passages to point out. You remember Jacob? Th- th- this, this was a moment when Jacob himself had to be rescued by the one his own sons had rejected. Israel itself had to be rescued by the leader rejected by Israel. Let's just remember that pattern that took place. Let's keep going, he says. But as the time of the promise drew near, when they were going to be delivered out of Egypt, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born. 
And he was beautiful in God's sight. And he was brought up for three months in his father's house. Remember, remember, the original charge was you're blaspheming Moses. What's he doing right now? He's affirming Moses. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds. Now, you want to feel this. Who was mighty in words and deeds at the beginning of this passage? Stephen. Who was mighty before that? Jesus. What's he doing? Subtly, he's pointing out. Uh, there's been previous people very mighty, and they're important to you too. Let's just bear that in mind. When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now, when 40 years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame, an angel, notice an angel, appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. And when Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. And as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. Where? Not in Israel. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. And Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, note the parenthetical insert, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs, very important phrase, wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the Israelites, God will raise up for you, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. Oh, now we're going to quote Moses. Now we're going to quote Moses. I mean, you start to feel, if you can get in the mind of a first century Israelite, you start to feel why the ultimate rebuke doesn't feel so abrupt to them as it does to us. This is the Moses who said, there's going to be a prophet like me, the signs and wonders deliverer who was rejected, like me from among your brothers. Stephen, you're blaspheming Moses. Let's quote Moses. Moses said, there's going to be a prophet like me from among your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel. Notice the location issues keep coming up again and again. He was in the wilderness. Where was he with the angel? In the wilderness. Who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. He received living oracles to give us. Our fathers, remember, pro-Moses, he's, pro, he, he's proving the opposite of their point. Our fathers, our fathers refused to obey him, but thrust him aside. And in their hearts, they turned to Egypt, saying to Aaron, make for us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who led us out from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days and offered a sacrifice to the idol and were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven as it is written in the book of the prophets. And then here Stephen makes a leap because he says, look, God said this in the prophets, which were much later to describe the people of Israel. And here's what they did in the wilderness. God said, Did you bring me slain beasts and sacrifices during those 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch, false god, and the star of your god, Raphan, and the images that you made to worship, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. What's he doing? You start to feel the, start to feel the power of it? He's pointing out, You are not reading your own law. Your own law says that God has raised up people that our forefathers rejected. Your own law says God is able to work in a way out of keeping with the limits and confines of this place and this location. Your own law says there's a pattern of deliverers who are first rejected by the people. Moses said there would be a prophet that would be raised up like me from among your brothers. 
Now he takes on the issue of the temple, the place that they claim he is blaspheming. Our fathers had the tent of witness where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nation that God drove out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet, yet, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What what kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? And now the turn that if we're a 21st century American, we tend to think is abrupt. But for Stephen, it's not particularly abrupt at all. Remember, their claim. You don't like Moses. You're blaspheming our God. You're saying Jesus is going to knock down this place. You are a blasphemer. You deserve to die. Stephen says, let's walk through our history. If you remember, God met Abraham outside of this place. Even our forefathers only got buried in a place that is currently under the control of the Samaritans. And if you remember Moses, God raised up Moses and he was rejected by the people. God raised up Joseph, he was rejected by the people. And God said, he made it clear that though he provided the temple, he wasn't limited to the temple. Brothers, read your own law, he seems to be saying. Read your own law. Let's remember our own history. He's speaking to them in this corporate identity. He's saying our own history shows a pattern of rejecting and limiting God when he's doing mighty things among us. And then he turns and addresses them directly in verse 44. Or, I'm sorry, in verse 51. You stiff-necked people uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now, if you're like me and you've ever read this story and, and felt like Stephen just loses his temper halfway through his historical lesson, what I'm hoping is reading it that way helps you understand. All along, he is building the case that it's not as though Israel's history is just one of responsive obedience to God's revelation and delightful reception of his deliverers and followership of his rulers and reception of his prophets. And all of a sudden, here Stephen comes along and says, you should follow Jesus. He says, no, actually the history is quite contrary to that. God raised up deliverers and they were rejected. God met people all over the place. And yet they limited him finally to his provision of a land of rest. You have missed some very important pieces of the law, which if you had read, would have perhaps caused you to be open to the possibility that God could move in an ultimate way that you would never have seen coming and wouldn't have expected, but should be receiving now by faith, lest you be like your fathers. So he rebukes them. And once again in Acts, we have a trial that's turned upside down. Who's on trial now? That's a major point in Acts. Christians are on trial in Acts, but really it's those who put them on trial who are on trial. The trials are always turned upside down. The judge is reversed. The accuser becomes the accused. Very important to see that. This is a biblical rebuke. Stephen just walked through their history and using a sort of corporate identity culminating in Jesus, he rebukes them. Don't reject Jesus, as you have done. You are those who rejected Jesus. And it's not surprising because that's always what seemed to happen in the history. You're just following the pattern written down in our law. Look beyond the law to the one for whom it was written, Steve could, Stephen could be saying. 
You're, you're not seeing the one the prophets foretold. You're not seeing the one Moses foretold. What's the point? The trial is turned upside down. Who's betraying Moses? It's the ones who won't listen to the one Moses prophesied would come. Who's rejecting Joseph? It's the ones who won't see in Jesus the recreation of a deliverer that was initially rejected. Who, who's the one actually rejecting God's purposes and God's angelic messenger? It is you, brothers rebuking them, rejecting them. And I, I think as, as nice pluralistic Americans, we're not often comfortable with this kind of rebuke. We need to learn from Stephen. Stephen's unafraid to call it like it is. If you reject Jesus, you are rejecting God. If you reject Jesus, you are rejecting God. That is how God views it. He will not view it any other way. There is no way to God apart from accepting Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you're not a Christian, you need to receive Stephen's rebuke as well. If you are rejecting or ignoring or postponing Jesus, you are rejecting or ignoring or postponing God. The Bible is, is not afraid to call it like it is. It's only as harsh as the truth is. Final section, exalted Savior. Now, when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Fourth section, an exalted Savior. The, the vision here tells the whole story. The story of Stephen, it, it is about Stephen, but it's more importantly about Jesus. Who's right about Jesus? This is one of two uh, kind of visions of the resurrected Jesus in Acts, and, and in some ways this is the most theological of the two. You notice he says, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazes into, he's allowed a sight into heaven itself, and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, now this, this is not a dream that he's having. This is not a sort of an imaginative thought. That this, this text is describing this in the same way that it's describing that he was grabbed out of the council and stoned. So th this is not apocalyptic literature. This is different than Revelation, where it says Jesus has a sword coming out of his mouth. Jesus doesn't physically have a sword coming out of his mouth. It's, it's imagery. This is narrative. Th this, is, this actually happened. Everything about the story, if it says there's a horse, there's a horse. If it says he fell off the horse, it means he fell off the horse. If it says they threw stones at him, it means he, they threw stones at him, like real stones at him, at his head. So when it says he saw Jesus, it means he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of the glory of God, and he calls him the Son of Man. Now, we have the advantage of having recently studied the book of Daniel. And you remember in that chapter... When Daniel says that there is one like a son of man and he is there with the ancient of days and all glory and all dominion is given to him. Well, Stephen sees that one. He sees that one and he knows who it is. So he sees Jesus and he says, look, I, I see what your prophet Daniel said we would see and I know who that is. I, I see it. It has come about. 
The thing Daniel looked forward to in the midst of all those beastly kingdoms with the dragons and everything of iron, the thing we were hoping for, the stone that would fill the whole earth and and destroy everything else but would last forever, that great son of man who is compared to the ancient of days and given dominion, I, I see him right now. the more he talks about him, the angrier they are and they drag him out and begin to stone him. What's happening right now? Well, the, the, the key point of this story is there's the heavenly, real perspective and there's the response of these people. Stephen is seeing, seeing what is real, what is true what is glorious, that Jesus Christ, the crucified one, has been raised to the right hand of God himself, that he is God's agent for judgment and blessing in humanity. He is seeing him exalted and glorified. He's seeing there is a a son of man at the right hand of God, a, a one, as Job would have said, who can lay his hand on both of us. There is a mediator there at God's right hand, and he's standing there in all of his fully risen and resurrected glory and I can see him and he testifies to this to the very people who claim to believe in Moses and in Daniel and in the temple and the law he's giving them the culmination of everything they claim to want the sight of God himself and so you see the the full depth of the irony plays out. God gives his people a messenger who can declare what is happening in heaven right then. And the people stop their ears, rush at him, and begin to stone him. The glory of Jesus is worth any offering for those who see him by faith. And it is the condemnation of those who reject that testimony. As readers, and as readers of of Luke's book here, we're given God's perspective of what's going on. We're able to see the travesty, the blasphemy that is actually going on. Do you feel that irony? We're able to receive heavenly perspective. The trial is turned upside down. Who is actually atrocious, animal-like in this passage? Who is deserving of death in this passage? It's those that are rejecting this one that, like an angel, is testifying to the greatness of God. So the the perspective is turned upside down and it's done so that we can receive faith. Look, if you believe in Jesus, you are like Stephen seeing what is real, what is true. And if you reject Jesus or if you face those that reject Jesus, you're, you're facing those that look like these animals rushing at him to crush him and throw stones at him until he dies. The vision here is central to the whole story. The whole point of the trial and now on the execution hinges on the question of who is actually on God's side? Who actually speaks for God? These opponents of Jesus or this man proclaiming in Jesus the culmination of God's salvation? The vision reveals the heavenly verdict. Stephen is in the right. Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus, the carpenter's son, who hung on that Roman tree, he is the exalted Savior. He stands at God's right hand. He is God's agent of judgment and salvation. The cross bearer is now Daniel's son of man. The cross bearer, the cursed one, is now Daniel's son of man, standing in equal glory to God, the centerpiece of all of God's purposes for blessing and judgment. And every authority and the name of every name has been given to him. Stephen, it says. And you love Luke's beautifully honoring description. Who is heavenly? Who's the heavenly martyr here? 
And who are the demonic-like accusers? As they're stoning him, he calls out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he reflects his Lord and cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Stephen, having traced Israel's history, now has the privilege of being the next step in it. He just talked about Moses' rejection and Joseph's rejection, and now he is the rejected prophet of the Lord. He is the rejected mouthpiece of God's testimony. And so he has this privilege, and I think for Stephen, if you, if you think about how he just read this history, he counts this moment as an, as an eternal privilege. I'm going to be, I'm a part of the story. I just talked about Abraham and God's great promise to him. And I talked about Joseph and how he's rejected, but he ultimately delivered the people. And I talked about Moses and, and the great final culmination of him in Jesus. And now I'm just representing Jesus as the rejected leader. And now I, I am now a part of that story. I will die as a part of that train of people who stood for God and yet were rejected because they saw what God was actually doing doing exalting Jesus Christ what effect do you think this has on the first century church what effect do you think it's supposed to have on us on you and me the logic is, is it's overwhelming since Jesus is the exalted Savior his witnesses will give their lives to proclaim his glory since Jesus is the exalted Savior, his witnesses will give their lives to proclaim his glory. Not because they have to, but because he's worth it. Since Jesus is the exalted Savior, truly, actually, his witnesses will give their lives to proclaim his glory. Final section. Just included here, oh, and such a delightful, ironic statement from God. 8, 1 through 4. And Saul approved of his execution. Readers of this would know, as we would know, that Saul becomes Paul, who does more to proclaim the gospel around the world than any other human being of the first century church. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria. Remember those terms, because that's when Jesus said there were going to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that should trigger something in this. Wait a minute, what, what's happening here? And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And now verse 4, Now those who were scattered went about doing what? Preaching the word. Got to tie the beginning of chapter 8 to what happens in chapter 7. There's irony. Because we've already seen this pattern. You try to oppose it, what does it do? It spreads it more. You try to kill him, what does it do? It spreads it more. Somehow the persecution arising out of Stephen is the reason why believers start going out into Judea and Samaria. So far they've been in Jerusalem. It starts to happen. The very thing they're trying doing to crush this testimony about Jesus only results in the word being scattered and the second stage of Jesus' promise begins to be fulfilled. And not only that, the very one who stood there like this psychotic executioner watching while they're stoning this angelic-like figure and watching over everybody's coats so they can throw more easily, he's the one that's going to be converted by this very risen Christ. The worst enemy of all will finally be used by God to proclaim the glory of Jesus Christ. Do you see what God's doing to the church as he writes this story? See what he's doing? It can't be stopped. It can't be stopped. And the glory goes to those who suffer for the name. And the condemnation goes to those who reject the name. 
Since Jesus is the exalted Savior, his gospel will go throughout the world and his witnesses find it an, an honor and a privilege and a glory to give their lives to this unstoppable gospel. A Christian says it'd be an honor to be Stephen. Quite the contrary effect that the leaders were hoping would be had when they started throwing rocks at him. They're hoping to silence him and instead... He is raised up as this noble example of what happens when you see Jesus by faith standing at the right hand of God. Unless we think that the only way we could reflect that glory is by dying. Listen to this quote from Elizabeth Elliot who knows quite a bit about death in the service of the Lord. She said, is the distinction between living for Christ and dying for him so great? Is not the second the logical conclusion of the first? Is the distinction between living for Christ and dying for him so great? Is not the second dying for him the logical conclusion of the first? So brothers and sisters, we can right now begin to reflect the glory of the risen Christ by giving our lives for him. And if some of us are called to give our lives to death for him, so much the better. Mothers, let me apply this. Do you see the giving of your lives to preach and reflect the gospel to your children? Though it costs you much, Simply following the footsteps of Stephen, showing the worth of your Savior. Fathers, do you see the giving of your lives to gospel dedication rather than a consuming love for money or ease as showcasing the truth about Jesus following in the footsteps of Stephen? Singles, Currently free from the delightful burden of marriage, but not to yoke yourselves to lust or laziness, but rather to showcase the worthiness of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, at the right hand of God. Children, or young men, young women, young ladies, Jesus does not count your age as a reason why his glory can't be seen in your life. Age is no limit to the glory of Jesus being shown in you. Senior saints, the day will come, perhaps in many years, I hope, perhaps in a few years, when you will have the opportunity to showcase a confidence in Christ when your health fades. Seize the moment. Seize the moment and show the world what it means to have a clear-eyed vision of Jesus Christ in the face of a declining body. Sufferers, the glory of the risen Christ is a vision that allows us to face any suffering with contentment because like Stephen, our days of pain and obedience and faithfulness will not last forever. Church, there is much to do here and around the world. But we are the people of the risen Christ. We must find ways to give and sacrifice our comfort now because we believe, we believe what Stephen saw, that he is the Son of Man, that the one who died for sinners is at God's right hand, and that now is the day of salvation, and that now is the day for the giving of our lives to showcase his glory. That there is no greater glory for us, no greater value for our lives, no greater purpose for you this week than to show the value of Jesus Christ in the way you give your life to him. Since Jesus is the exalted Savior, his witnesses will gladly give their lives 
to proclaim his glory. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your giving of this story of our brother Stephen. I thank you that through his life we see your glory. Lord, we thank you for those like Stephen that faced with peacefulness and joy even their own death given for your glory. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us by faith that sight and sense of your greatness. You are the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. You are God the Son, incarnate and exalted, offering salvation to any who believe in you. Help us to love your glory above anything else. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.